Welcome everyone. This is our Wednesday Wisdom where we go over tips, tricks, and information on woodwind repair. Today I've got Leroy in the shop and Leroy is going to be going over how to fit a swollen clarinet tenon. This is a problem that is common in newer instruments and it's something that's a little different um, that we haven't gone over before. This is basically where the joints won't fit together. Correct. Um, Leroy, is this the same as fixing a clarinet tenon cork or is it something entirely different? Uh, it is different because um, the cork you're actually just trying to make sure that the I'll say the fit is good and snug between the joint and the actual barrel. This this is a problem where the, this, the actual physical part of this is too big and it catches on the on the ten on the tenon receiver. So you can see right now if I put this upside down, it's just, it's stuck on there. Okay. And so it's because it's actually rubbing against one of these shoulders that you can kind of see real quick there. So what we have to end up doing is taking measurements of the inside of the barrel and actually of the shoulders themselves on the, on the top joint. So when you're diagnosing that problem, mm -hmm. you're fitting the, for in this case, you're fitting the barrel on and yeah. the barrel should fall off. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There, With there, no tenon cork on. Correct. Okay. Yeah, there should be no, there should be no, con there should be no, I'll say friction contact between the barrel and the body itself. So to measure the inside, the receiver, what I'm going to be using is a, an ID bore gauge. This is a cool little tool that is, the top is spring loaded. And at the bottom here, there's a, there's a tightener. So what I can, what I'll show you real quick is like, I can push that to, to, to whatever diameter that is, turn the, turn the tightener and then it stays in place. Once you're done, you can release it and it opens back up. Hmm. So Very what I'm going to cool. do is take the, take the barrel. I'm going to measure the farthest point down on the barrel itself. So I'll put that in there. I'll tighten that up. I'll pull that out and then I'll get my digital caliper and then I will actually measure that. So that'll give me what the, the measurement is on the farthest point on the on the barrel receiver. So we're at 927. So I've got my handy dandy drawing right here. So on the upper point, I'm gonna put 927. This is this allows me to not have to remember every single number that I'm doing because there's gonna be enough numbers as it is. The least I have to remember, the better off I'm gonna be. Now Leroy, is there uh why do you use a gauge instead of you know the depth gauge on your caliper? Uh, that's a good question, actually. Um, the, I have run into uh, issues where the receiver itself, the one of the two measurements is actually different. Mm. So say, for instance, if I'm going for the one that's the farthest inside, say if that's actually wider than the, the, the receiver part out here, mm -hmm. If I use my calipers and go inside of here, it's going to catch on the smallest part first. And it actually won't give me a good definitive measurement on the farthest point on the inside. Okay. So this allows me to really, really manipulate where I measure and, and what, I'll say, and what the measurement and where the measurement is. Cool. So this one is on the upper part of the barrel. So I'm going to measure that. So we're at 9, 928. So I'm going to write that down on my drawing there. So now we're going to measure, so now I'm actually done with this tool because I'm not measuring anything inside now. So now I'm going to measure the shoulders of the tenon itself. So I'm going to measure the top one. So we're at 920. Move that out of the way. And then I'm going to measure the lower part here. And we're about 929, 930, depending on where I'm at. Where I'm at. So we'll put 929. All right. So if we look at my numbers here, so this, so this top number is obviously going to be for the top part here. So the male part of the, the tenon is smaller than the receiver. So this is good. So 920, 927, we're good on this. We don't need to do anything with the top. Okay. The Male part on the bottom is 929, the receiver is 928. It's super, super close, but this is a little bit bigger. So the idea that I usually go for, and it gives a little bit of wiggle room, especially for wood clarinets that will expand and contract mm -hmm. as you play and over time, 
I usually like to leave about a 10 thousandths difference in here. So the goal number I'm going for is 10 thousandths smaller than where it's going to. So my goal is 918, okay? So now at this point, I will take the upper joint and I will go to a lathe that I've actually set and prepped. So here on the chuck side, I, have, I just have a bench peg and then I have a live center on this side. And then for your cutter, it's just a straight cutter, so you can actually get a nice straight cut on that shoulder, on the tenon, okay? It is also important when you're, ch when you're putting this thing and mounting this thing on the lathe to not over-tighten not over tighten the joint on the lathe because you can split that joint in half. So usually I'll just kind of like let it, let it free, let it free roll. Once it stops a little bit, I'll just, just give it a little extra turn to make sure that it stays in place and then we're good to go. I am going to now grab my optivisor to put a little magnifier on my head so I can see what's going on. I am now going to get this as close as possible before I start this. And you're also going, you're going to spin that clarinet joint and you actually have a Delrin clarinet bench peg chucked into the lathe. Is Correct. Right? Yeah, cool. you can, uh, you can use Delrin. The Delrin is the one that I usually use just because that's what I have on hand. Okay. Um, you're more than welcome or uh, if you have a metal one, you can do that one too. Uh, it's just the Delrin one is what I have on hand. Gotcha. So I'm going to get this close. And once I get this close, I'm going to turn the lathe on and then I'm going to take a little, material, a little bit of material off here. All right, let's see where we landed. So the first quick check, uh, test would be to basically just put this on here and see if it falls off. So mm. there is no friction there now, which is great. So we're at, least, we're at least smaller than the diameter of the actual inside of the barrel itself. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my caliper again and I'm gonna measure this to see where we land. 925, 924, we're close, but just so we can um, make sure that there's a little bit of room for expansion for, for wooden joints, especially when a player is playing, it will expand a little bit. It's always good to take a little more off. Uh, this particular barrel doesn't, but most, um, most clarinets will have like a wooden, wooden barrel or whatever, and then have metal tenon rings. Okay. In that spot, the wood uh, the wood really won't expand. So if this so if this part expands, and this doesn't expand, and it's too close, it could still possibly catch, even with the measurement being less than this. But it's still that close. Okay. Which is why I usually like to do the ten thousandths difference. Now, you're using the live center to spin the joint. Is it possible to use just a regular center? Uh, you no. And I'll say that only because what will end up happening is you're basically um, on this part here. Well, I mean on the Delrin side. This is, the, this is actually pressed up against it. So this is spinning with this. So okay. this is the live center and this, the center spins. Mm. If this was fixed, then this part, this tenon would actually be spinning on whatever piece this would be, which mm. is not good because then you could actually either ruin the wood, ruin the tool, whatever. So having a live center is absolutely key to making sure that this is done properly. Gotcha. So I'll do that. We're going to take a little bit more off again and see where we land. Oops, there we go. I didn't have it tight enough. See, I would actually rather have it, 
me stop that real quick. I would see what happened there where it actually stopped spinning as I was going. Yeah. I didn't have it tight enough, which is fine. I would actually rather have it a little on the loose side than over tighten it. So if that happens, don't freak out. Just back the, just back the tool off, get a, tighten it just a teeny bit more, and then you can go back to it, which is exactly what I'm gonna do. So we'll do that, and then we're gonna go back to it real quick here. Oops. Okay. All right. So let's see how this lands. Okay. So we already know the barrel doesn't catch on this. So we're going to me we're going to measure this. So we're at 918 which is exactly where we wanted to be, right? So that gives mm -hmm. us that 10,000s difference. Sweet. Obviously it doesn't catch on here. So at this point what we do, so the tenon is now fit to the barrel. At this point we would just basically do the tenon cork, do a tenon cork fit, and then you're actually all done with that repair. There's no other finishing that you would do with that process? Um, you can, I ha if you have a nice sharp cutter on your lathe, you usually don't, because that'll leave you a nice cut and a nice finish on that wood. Okay. Uh, if for some reason you want to just like shine it up or do something a little bit special, or if there's like a couple burrs that you can see, um, using 600 grit sandpaper and finer is more than acceptable. Um, anything like that, just to knock any loose edges off or give it a shine, that's totally acceptable to do. Now, is there, I mean, if somebody was trying to go quickly with this job in the shop, are they able to leave the tenon cork on? Um, you can. Uh, the only thing that I would advise against doing that would be um, the tenon cork itself can give you like a false reading of whether or not mm. the, the barrel is actually catching the body. Okay. Um, many times I've run into, especially on newer horns, let the, the wood will expand and that'll catch, is the tenon cork itself will actually be on the small side. So once you actually remove that wood, it actually doesn't fit real well at all. So the, the only reason it was actually having a semi-decent fit was because the, of the body to tenon contact. So mm. like the wood and barrel contact instead of like the cork. Okay. Excellent. Well, I just have a couple of questions sure. you, about the, the lathe. Mm -hmm. So this lathe has a DRO. Um, are you using that for this procedure or are you going by feel? What has your experience been? It's a good question. Um, my experience, I've been doing this, I've been doing the tenon fitting thing for about 20 years. Um, I personally don't use the DRO just because I've, I've done it by feel mm -hmm. and with, with an optivizer so I can actually see what's going on for so long. That's what I'm comfortable with doing. If the numbers in the DRO are your thing and it works for you, you're more than, more than happy to do that kind of thing. Just the important part is to make sure that how you take it off, the end result is the um, is the ten thousandths difference. That's the that's the biggest that is the biggest part here. So hmm. with the difference of those two numbers, however you get there, as long as it's a slow process and not a fast process, that is the most important part. And what kind of cutting tool are you using? Um for for doing that procedure? It's just a it's just a flat cutter. Is that right? Parting blade. Parting blade. Yeah, yeah. It works great. It, it's it's nice and flat, and it gets right up. It gets right up against that um, that shoulder, and it gives a nice clean cut. Now, is this also something that you can use? Uh, is this a procedure you can do on oboe as well? Absolutely. Um, okay. It's just, it's basically the same identical thing. It's just the um, I'll say the diameter of what you're working with is smaller because the bore of an oboe is smaller than a clarinet. Um, yeah, exactly the same procedure, no difference. And then, so you're basically relegated to the sides of your lathe. So we, we've got a 40 inch mm -hmm. bed here. So we could fit a bass clarinet on our lathe, but how small right. a lathe can you use when you're, when you're doing this? Or that's what's a, the recommended size? That's a good question as well. Um, honestly, as long as you can fit the joint that you're working on. So like if we're, so since we're working on the separate joint here, 
as long as this is going to be heading towards our clarinet basics course which starts on june 7th so if you have any questions or comments feel free to uh, comment below or share and like this video if you're enjoying this series of live streams and we'll also be doing our uh, basics uh, clarinet repair course uh, again starting on june 7th so yes. check out musicmedic.com for that uh, and that's going to do it for now until next time happy repairing